<laughs> Joe, Joe, what are you going to do in 2023? <laughs> I th- you know, th- that means that I've been here almost a year, not quite. I think I started sometime in middle of January, maybe, something like that. <laughs> What's that? January 9th. January 9th. I gave myself 90 days. <laughs> hey, we got past that. <laughs> got past six months. <laughs> you haven't fired me yet, so <laughs> that's good. I want you to think about some things. You know, for two weeks, we've been talking about the birth of Christ. We've been talking about him coming, how he came, the importance of that birth, how it was predicted, you know, how it was prophesied in the Old Testament. And then 700 years before he came. And then he was, of course, he's born in, in Bethlehem. He's laid in the manger, the trough. Um, where cattle come and drink or eat. Um, there's no room for him in the end. Uh, there's a star that leads, there's a star that leads the, the Magi who, you know, is kind of interesting, like I said, in the, in the sense that God tells us don't, don't use sorcery, don't, don't do those things, but yet he picks Magi who can tell dreams and he uses a star and, and he uses shepherds, you know, they're on the social bottom part of the realm where nobody wants anything to do with them because they're considered stinky and dirty and defiled and unclean. And, and so, uh, but he, he, those are the first ones on the scene when this baby is born. Um, and we talked some about what that all means and stood for, that it made Jesus accessible. So I, I want you to think about that. So for two weeks, we've been, we've been working on that theme. I, I wanted to open it with this story. So there's this lady praying in her, in her house. She's, she's in her room and she's in her bedroom and she's praying. She said, God, I, pre- I pray that you'll fill my pantry. I'll, I pray that you'll give me food. She's praying kind of loud. She's talking to herself and her neighbor hears her. And the neighbor goes and buy food, buys food and puts it on the front porch. He rings the bell and he hides in the bushes. And she opens the door and says, God did it. God did it. God did it. He jumps out of the bush and he says, no, God didn't do it. I did it. And uh, she says, God did it. He said, God did it. And she, he says, you're not listening to me. I'm an atheist. God didn't do it. And she says, God did it. God did it. And you got the devil to pay for it. <laughs> I, I want you to see that when God can use whatever God wants to use. God used a star to lead the shepherds to where the baby was born. God used shepherds. To be the first one on the scene for a reason. Nothing God did in that scene was by mistake. He did it with a purpose. He did it with a plan. He did it completely worked it out. God sent the Bible says his son into the world when the time was right. When God sent Jesus to be born. He looked and he said this is the time to send my son into the world. Why then? Why on that day? Well, you could look at history and you could come up with a lot of reasons. You could say, well, the Rome, Rome was in charge. The language, the Greek language has been spreading there. Now they could communicate. They had roads. They had travel. They had all kinds of reasons. But God knew exactly when to send his son. And he sent his son when the time was right. And he sent him in the means he wanted to send him. And there was no mistake by any of that. The one thing that the world still needs today is a savior. We had a savior that was born and came in the world. But <laughs> our world still needs a savior. I was hoping. You probably can't see this. You ever heard of the after-school satanic program? You know this is, goes on in some schools now in America? Every school that has a religious program, this club can come and they can join. Because according to the First Amendment, if you let one club come, you got to let them all come. There's schools in Illinois. There's schools in California. There's schools in uh, Virginia now that have this after-school satanic program. If you could read this fine print, it would say things like they have science projects, puzzles, games, arts and crafts projects, nature uh, activities. It sounds just like everything you'd want to send your son to, your kids to. And they teach them, they say, we don't teach them about religion. We don't want to proselyte. We want them to use their minds. We want them to be open. We want them to be able to challenge. We want them to challenge the the, the teaching of the falsehood of Christianity. If you really read between the lines is what they're saying. But this is what goes on in our country today. How did we get here? How did we ever become a people from this baby being born in a manger to to a society that has after school satanic programs in their high schools? Actually, it's not in high school. It's one to sixth grade. Ask yourself why they go after first graders or second graders or third graders. Because they know if they can control the minds of these young children, they can destroy America the way we see it today. They may say they're not proselyting, but what they're teaching is false doctrine. They're they're trying to say what they say in between the line is that, well, kids, you can um, you can decide to be whatever you want to be. 
See, we have this woke agenda. So you can be, you, you don't have to be a girl just because you think you're a girl. And you don't have to be a boy just because you think you're a boy. You can come to our club and we'll accept you for just how you are. And they use that relativism where there's no truth no more. Truth is only what you make it to be. This isn't nothing new in our country. We've been doing this for a long time. We may not have had this club. But for a long time, we pushed God out to a side and said, hey, there's no truth no more. You can believe anything you want to believe. Whatever makes you happy. Whatever floats your boat. Whatever makes you tick. That's how these programs come around. They masquerade as, as something good for kids. And in the, in the meantime... The devil, Satan, the powers of, of darkness are out to attack us and get us. We need a savior. I put, it says, how broken is America? How broken is the world? How broken is our community? How broken is our homes? How broken is our churches? <laughs> I, the last one made me, <laughs> if you saw our Facebook page this week. <laughs> I told myself, don't get caught on this, but boy, that guy made me mad. <laughs> I finally hit his comment. All upset over children singing a Christmas song. All saying that it's, it's not biblical and you name it on and on and on. And I was raised in churches that kind of felt the same way. But you know what? I call hogwash and all that. And one of the biggest problems I see for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. This isn't the verse I was looking for. I must have it down farther in the slide. But what I want you to know is nobody should ever do anything against their conscience. That's in Romans 14. I'm fine with that. But when your conscience tells you that you have the right to tread on somebody else and tell them that, you know, they're, everything they're doing is wrong, I start to question whether or not you really know your Bible very well. And how serious you are about reaching the lost. I, there was a verse, I, and maybe I'll find it. Let's see if I go down here. Oh, is it one of these? Well, it must be, I must have had it further down, I buried it. But the whole concept is the idea that if the church isn't united, and is, if the kingdom isn't united, it will divide and it will fall. I think it's in 1 Corinthians. My point being is, we can sit here and we can point peach, uh, fingers at each other all we want all day long. I can find problems with Paul, and Paul can find problems with Jesse. But if we want to stop this satanic worship in our society, if we want to make a difference, we want to offer a savior to the world, we're not going to do it by fighting with each other, arguing over stupid little things. If we can't keep the majors major and the minors minor, how are we going to expect them to do that out in the world? If we can't rather around, gather around a time and think about the goodness of a baby being born and how that baby brought salvation into the world and without a birth, there wouldn't have been a death. And we're going to fight over that. How are we going to go to a world and tell that world, hey, you need this savior that me and him can't even agree upon. I just, I find that difficult. And I, I just want you to know, I, the reason I put these verses up was because like in Romans 128, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. So God gave them a, when I think about our country and where we have gotten, when I think about these clubs, I think it's because they, God has turned their mind over to be a reprobate, if you will, that they chase after anything and everything they want to. They find their own pleasures in their own way. When you take away all truth, you remove morality, you remove ethics. You can become and do anything you want to. Because after all, there's no truth. So it's only what makes you happy. You look at our country and ask yourself if that's not what you see lots of times. I'm doing what I want to do because it pleases me and I don't care what anybody else thinks about it. And the church and the family is under attack. And those programs are under attack. I, didn't even, I really wasn't even going to put that slide up because I didn't want to give them credit to even... Even post their slide, their poster, you know, their thing, their flyer. It's so evil to me and so sinful that I didn't want to give them a moment of my sermon. But if we don't preach against the sin that's in the world, then how will we ever change the world? And so we got, we got to stand up for the truth. 1 Peter 4, 3 says, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality. Basically, in that verse, he says, The time is done that you, don't, you no longer live in the way you used to live. If you're a child of God, things have changed. Those, those things are to be put aside. You're different now. We have to be different. In 2023, the church has to be different. It should be different all the time. But we, we, have, to, we have to realize 
that this country is under attack and that we have to stand up for the truth. And I'm not saying that like the guy did in our Facebook page about me calling him, him out because of some, some stupid song or kid song. I'm talking about standing for the truth that makes a difference and telling people you're about a Savior that came to this earth and died for their souls. And why we ought to live different and be different. Because if we don't, this is the kind of stuff that will come into our country and has come into our country. I said, what's the number one sin in America? And I put adultery. I'll tell you why I think it's adultery. Because when you can start building up any kind of God that you want to start building up, every other sin falls underneath it. When you start thinking that you can do anything you want, everything that you want, that there's no consequences, that there's no punishment, that there's, and that's what that satanic club will tell you, that there's no hell, that's just myth. There's no supernatural. Science is on our side. And that's not true. You can go home and Google. You can find all kinds of science articles, science articles that will tell you that the reason that they can prove that the earth is, 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 has, was created now is because they know there's over 200 attributes that you have to have in order for this planet to survive. In other words, the, it started out in like 1996. Some, some astrologer, you know, he posted an article and he, he said that uh, you have to have two. You have to have a superstar and you have to have a planet. And that planet has to be the exact distance from that superstar. You know, now it's grown to over 200. When they did that, they said, well, that we, we're going to be able to prove this. We're going to be able to go into space by, by billions and billions of these trillions of numbers, you know, like, like a number with seven zeros after it or 27 zeros after it. We're going to be able to prove this, and we know it because we're going to be able to go into space. We're going to find this other life, and when we do that, we're going to prove a fact that this was just a Big Bang Theory, right? Well, guess what? We're in 2022, and they've never been able to prove it. That's a zero with no zeros behind it. That's the evidence that they got. They thought they'd prove it out. But their science has proven that the earth can only exist because of, of, of a supernatural God. If the earth rotates just a, a degree closer to the sun, it burns up. Just a degree away, it freezes up. You have to have nutrients in order to grow food. Only the earth has, has done that. You have to have water. Only the earth provides it. You have to have air just right. Only the earth does it. It's, not, it's a bigger fallacy to, to think that some big bang theory happened to make it happen than it is to put faith in an almighty God who put it in the ground because you can't be a, your body can't function like it does without a, without a God who put it together. It's a bigger guess on their part than it is on our part to have faith in God who said, let it be. And then breathed it into existence or spoke it into existence. We have evidence on our side. And they've been searching and searching and searching and searching to prove us wrong. And have never been able to come up with one, one bit of evidence to support their theory. They build a theory based upon a, a result that they want. Oh, there was a big bang theory. And then they start putting all their hypotheses together to try to prove that. They have not been able to prove it or sustain it. So when they say, when these clubs say that we don't have science on our side, because what they'll say is, well, we're going to use the mind. We're going to let the mind, the intellect. Well, you read some of them verses earlier about in Romans where God turned their mind over. Their mind is warped. They can use their mind all they want, but if they don't acknowledge God, they start off on a bad basis of all the things that they plan to do. And so I say to you today that the world still needs a savior. And this country needs to repent. Not just this country, though, the whole world. Here's a startling fact. One person dies every 11.14 seconds. I think in America it's something like 2.8 million a year. It's a 7,700, almost 8,000 uh, per day. Worldwide, it's 56 million people. Right now, before the sermon is over, how many deaths will there be? The world needs a savior. Because somebody is going to die. And they're going to meet their maker. And no matter what these false prophets preach or teach about there is no God, there's a God and there's a hell. And you will face judgment one day. And the world needs a savior. It's a startling fact. I want you to think about this. Winning doesn't happen by, by chance. <laughs> Just think if you were, 
on, the, on, on December 31st, Michigan is going to play TCU. And when we win and they run out on the field and they talk to this quarterback and they say, how did you pull this off? And he says, well, I, I don't know. I just I got off the bus and I just walked out there and played the game and we won. No, he worked at it. He went to practice. He struggled. He got in the trenches and he fought. Winning doesn't come by chance. If we're going to win as a church, we're going to win because we plan, we work, we put strategy into it. We rolled up our sleeves and got busy. The reason those silly clubs come around is because we've been sleeping. We let them get into our schools when they should never be in our schools. And I don't care if a judge passes it or not. It's silly. It's stupid. It's ignorant. And it's wrong. We don't need them. And I don't care if they say, well, you have to because it's the First Amendment. No, we don't. This country was formed on godly principles. Amen. And just because, you know, the law now says we can't do anything about it, I'd say we can do something about it. We can start living like it matters and we can start showing up and we start voting them out if that's what it takes. You don't win by accident. You win by work. You remember what Paul said? You run the race to win that race. You run it to get a crown. You fight. You don't just, he says, you just don't swing at the air like, like you're not boxing. Get in the ring with somebody and just swing around like a crazy man and see how long you last. Our Savior told us we're in a fight. We're to fight. I think about this all the time. You know, you know, one of our problems is we've watered it down too much. We think, I've told you this before, but we think it's a cute little prayer that says, you know, I, I just... Lord, just take me into your heart. I, I, I mean, I brought you into my heart. I'm okay. No. When you become a child of God, you're on, the, you're, on, you're on his team. And you're in the trenches to fight. We say, oh yeah, but God promised his full abundant life. Why don't you tell that to the apostle Paul? You know what his full abundant life consisted of? Beating with rods. Beating with whips. Shipwreck. Imprisonment. That's what you promised by God. <laughs> Don't sound like fun, does it? But you weren't called to just think that, you know, everything's going to be wonderful now. You're called to fight a battle. From, we war against this, this battle that we war against the dark ages. You, you think we're fighting just some simple little battle? We're fighting the devil himself. We, we are to suit up and go to battle. And we'll go to battle to win that thing, not to lose it. And you might lose your life in the battle. Be thou faithful unto death. Revelation 2.10. And thou shalt receive a crown of righteousness. You're not called to, to, to worry about that. This world is not your home. You're just a passing through. You, you sing that song. You know it's true. You don't have to store up your treasures on this earth. You're storing up in heaven where they don't rot out. Now ask yourself. Is that who you are? Or you store up your treasures here? Because I know I fight with it. <laughs> I know it's a struggle for me not to think about tomorrow. As far as what I'm going to get. And how much more I can get. And how much more I'm going to get paid. And how much more I can put in the bank. And what other piece of toy I can buy. What piece of equipment that's going to get me. For we not wrestle against flesh and blood. But against powers. Against the rulers of darkness of this age. Against spiritual hosts of wickedness. This sounds like we got a battle on our hands. Sounds like he's out to get us. Sounds like we need to be awake and alert and pay attention to where we're going and where we're going and what we get caught up in. The cares of the world are so easy. I said, I wanted to say fight with the word. Matthew 4, Jesus told Satan every time he was tempted, you know, he said, well, it is written. Turn these rocks into bread. He said, no, nah, it's written, man. Don't live by, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Well, cast thyself down. No, nah, it's written. You don't tempt the Lord thy God. Jesus knew the Bible. He knew the word of God. We ought to too. James tells us the prayer of faith, uh, the prayer of faith will save the sick in the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I'd say in this battle we need to be praying. We need to be praying and we need to be reading and we need to be in study so that when we see the evils that come against us, we're fighting for them. I said we should put on the full armor. You know Ephesians 6. You know what it is to put on that helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, have your feet shod, have the sword. When you, when you fight the enemy, you should 
put on every piece of armor you can. Again, I'd go back to football. If you go out on the field without a helmet and some pads on, you're probably going to get hurt. <laughs> you're probably going to get, when that guy that weighs 305 pounds and comes, <laughs> comes in on it and hits you, you're probably going to wish you had pads and a helmet on. You go out here in this world and you fight evil that's in this world, you're going to wish you took God with you. You're not only going to wish you took a little bit of God with you, you're going to wish you took all of God with you. Everything you can take from the scriptures to prayer to fasting to singing to praising, you should take it all. Don't leave any of it at home. Suit up. And then go into the battle. I said fight with complete confidence and assurance. That's what Hebrews 11.1 1 says. You ought to have faith in those things that you, know, that you haven't seen. Hope, assurance. God says he's going to win. We win. We know we win. We have already won. But that doesn't get us out of the battle. We must fight. And so I hope, I hope you be that kind of person. We fight with your, with your, as if your life depends on I quoted that verse from 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Man, the mission we have is so important. Would you fight for your children? If they said they were going to put that club in up here at our school, would we stand up? Would we pull our kids out if we had to? Would we say, no way, this is coming in my community? And I know, I know I've listened to the arguments. I know they're going to say, we're going to get sued. I know they're going to say, we can't win this in a court. I say to that, then we go and do something different. We put our kids in a better place. I'm, and that might cost you money. It might cost me money. I'm not letting my kid go to school to some after satanic club. And you say, well, that might just be funny. Let me give you another example. Do you know that a few years ago, art was in court in our system? There was a, there was a museum that had art up. And there were people that were very upset because that art was prov provocative. It, it, was, it was pornography. And it was nasty. And you can imagine what that pornography entailed. And it went to court because people were opposed against it and there were people who were for it. And it lost in our courts because they said, no, that's fine art. Did you see the lighting and the texture? And we left it in the museum because we called it fine art. It was filth. And it should never be in our museum. But we in our country, in our court system, said that's okay because it's fine art because of the lighting and the texture. And the Bible says, no, it's pornography, it's filth, and it ought not be. You think we're not in a battle? Satanic clubs, from art, to the woke movement. In 2023, I hope we understand that we need a savior. And that the only way we can make a difference is when you and me make a difference. You know that these movements, didn't, the satanic club movement started in about 2016. They didn't, they didn't have a lot of success. By 2022, they're now getting into schools because they found out way around the law. You know that most of these things that we're talking about didn't start in our country by a gunshot, cannonball. They started by a whisper. It started by people talking, standing around, talking about, wow, I don't see what's wrong with that. I don't see a problem with this. That would be cool. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, there's no truth. Yeah, truth is just relative. It's just whatever you think. And 30, 40, 50 years later, we're living in a country that doesn't know that there's truth. That doesn't want anything to do with God that, have pushed, that has pushed him out from about everything they can push him out of because it doesn't please them as it goes against their things the devil comes to steal and kill not god god brought a savior into the world because he knew what mankind needed i want to say this too again i thought about that facebook post you see the last one that said and, and though a man might prevail against one who is alone two will withstand him a threat a threefold cord is not quickly broken and then you got the Matthew there about where two or three are gathered, there I shall be too. The church has been too divided too long. You, you, you want to make a difference in the world, you've got to stand together. 
Go out again in that football field all by yourself and face the 11 guys and see how well you do. Be a quarterback with no front line blocking for you and see how many passes you complete. Be the running back and not have any blockers. See where you get. See how many yards you move the ball. And the church for too long has been fighting with each other. And then we ask ourselves, how come we can't score a touchdown? How come we can't move the ball? How come we can't gain any ground? Oh, brother, it's all because, you know, I don't care about them stories. What I care about is people who quit honoring God with their lips and grow near to him with their hearts. We write things, we say things, we post things that have nothing to do with salvation. And then we wonder why our kids want nothing to do with church. I'd say in 2023, let's put away some of that division. And let's become a family of believers that care about each other. And I know we do. But maybe somebody will be listening to this video. Maybe that gentleman who wrote on the page will check out my video. (laughs) I doubt it. Unless he's going to write something nasty. (laughs) Seems funny, but that has hurt the church. It's hurt us. It's hurt us from Kirby to whatever all these other places are around us. Hopper, you name it. Athens, Pleasant Home. Why aren't we one with all? (laughs) What holds us back from caring more about others? Are we that righteous? We, 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 We know everything to the T. That my way is the only way. Kind of like the words that Jesus might have said, Father, <laughs> thy will be done, not mine. <laughs> I have an idea. I have an idea that if that was more of us, God, your will, not my will. Next time I get ready to respond to some ugly argument on some Facebook page, and all I'm going to do is say something negative about my brothers and sisters, maybe I ought to ask, God, your will be done, not mine. I don't care how you mask it. I was going to run through these. We're not going to run through them, but I just want you to know, these are all these science stuff. Uh, this is Albert Einstein. He said, the more I studied science, the more I believed in God. Nobel Prize, uh, Nobel Prize winner, you know, in physics in 1921. and 99, he was the person of the century. I, I just want you to know that there's all these scientists that I had up there that w- would prove you over and over. Some of them were atheists that became out of atheism because they said science has proven to them that this globe could not be what it is. This world that we live in could never have happened by chance. That it's too unique. And so I was going to run through some of them. But, but I want you to know that that proof and evidence is out there. Because when you run into these clubs or you run into somebody who says, oh, the Bible is just a myth. Archaeology studies have proven what the Bible has written. They found coins. They found papyra. They found buildings. They found all kinds of stuff that proves exactly what the Bible says. And they can run and they can hide and they can call it their woke agenda all they want. But the truth is, they deny the fact that they need a savior in their life because they don't want anybody telling them what to do or how to live. They don't want anybody to tell them that, that it's wrong to, to, to love a tree. <laughs> Seems silly, but it exists. It's so silly, I, can, I can't even imagine having to make an argument against it. <laughs> Duh, I'm sorry, it don't make sense. That's where we are. So, hey, <laughs> Merry Christmas to you all. <laughs> and to all, Happy New Year. <laughs> I, there's one thing I'll, I'll close with this. The Bible is full of hope for the brokenness. So we we'll go through that whole thing. But the, but the word of God says, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. The word of God says, if you're broken and you're lonely and you, you need help, you come to me and I'll, I'll show you the way. The word of God says, you come and I'll listen and I'll help. You come to God and he promises that you won't be sorry. You come to God and your life will be changed. There is hope for America. I don't believe we've seen our best days. I don't believe that. I could be wrong. I'm not, I'm not a prophet. But I'm not going to go to bed a pessimist. I'm gonna, you know, I preach this sermon, but I preach it because I stand against the enemy. 
But I believe that I beat the enemy already. He may be looking like he's winning. He may, he may think he's gaining ground. He may think he's, I don't believe it. Now I believe at the end of the day, I know I'm happy because I know my Savior. And I know what I'm promised. And I know they can chase after all those, own, those things that they want to chase after. And in the end, they'll be empty. Why do you think so many of them die when you, read, when you turn on the TV or you read a paper and you see if some famous person who's got millions of dollars, everything it seems like going for them, and then they take their own life? They're not happy. They're lost. And they're lonely. And the only place you're going to find that kind of happiness, fulfillment, a friend that won't leave you, is what's in here. So I don't buy into that, that lie that the devil is teaching. Now, I, 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 I worry about our country. I think I'd be wrong not to pray for our country. I'd be wrong not to see it like Israel, who went astray. And every time they came back, they had to repent. They had to see, their, they had to see how bad they were. They had to repent. They had to ask for forgiveness. And I hope our country will do that. I hope we'll lead the way. Because it won't be led by anybody else. It's not going to be led by a, a non-believer. <laughs> they don't believe. It's going to be led by us. And by others like us. So, uh, Logan, you, Logan's going to come and lead us in a song. And I do wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And uh, come on, brother.